which is a very hard act to follow too. Uh, your passion and your commitment to te- teaching is something that I also have, and I'm seeing the same thing destroyed by the attempt to create an artificial market system and replace everything with competition. If you want to understand what conventional economics is about, it's got a single vitamin C, add competition, everything is going to be better. Of course, the, the crazy thing about this is that you don't buy education like you buy a, a bag of muesli. Okay? You must, if you eat muesli, how many thousand bags do you reckon you've bought in your lifetime? You know which brands you prefer. You don't have to buy the same one again the next week. You can change. Education is a one-off choice. You don't know anything near enough to be able to make those decisions to make it into a marketplace in the first place. And that's the insanity of applying conventional economics to an area where it just simply does not belong. Now, another issue in economics, which is what I'll be talking about, is the whole role of the government. Should the government run as a surplus? And, of course, that's been the religion for the last... 10 years, and certainly was rammed down the throats of Labor Party supporters in the last election. If you read the Conservative Manifesto, this is how they described the state of the economy five years ago. Britain was reeling from the chaos of Labor's Great Recession. And the budget deficit was, was uh, more than 10% of GDP, the highest in peacetime history, etc., etc., and they were going to reduce all that. Now, this is pretty much stock standard fare for Conservative parties around the world. The pity is the Labor Party here fell to the same line. If you read the Labor Party manifesto in 2015, it didn't read so much like a manifesto as an apology. A Labor government will cut the deficit every year. It was either the first or the second sentence in the manifesto. The first line of the budget will be, just in case you didn't get the message, this budget cuts the deficit every year. And then if you didn't get that message, we had it for you a third time. This budget cuts the deficit every year, etc., etc. In other words, the budget deficit was being blamed as the cause of the recession which only occurred in England because of the Labor Party. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, I might just, just pay. I normally, when I show graphs, and pardon me, you're going to get a whole lot of graphs from me. Anne Pettifor had a bit of fun talking about me giving you a lecture on Minsky. I'm not going to be quite that cruel, Anne, but I'll, I'll, I'll certainly work some graphs up. And normally, when I put a graph up, I do it starting with time and progressing forward. But I'm going to go backwards now, and I want to show you government debt in the UK as a percentage of GDP. And so, what's happened to that? Do we have unprecedented government debt right now? Well, in one sense, maybe we do. It's certainly bigger than it's been. 1960. But that's the history of British government debt as a percentage of GDP back to 1700. Okay? Now, it's been a bit bigger in the past, and that, of course, was the Second World War, a major factor there. But here I'm looking at the 1950s and 1960s, which, so far as I know, wasn't seen as a time of economic crisis for England. Okay? So this little blip here has been made up as though it's never happened before, it's unprecedented, we can never sustain it, it'll kill the economy. Well, I think it was back when England was called an empire back then, wasn't there? This is back in the 1800s. You seem to carry the debt fairly effectively back then. And the budget deficit is the highest in peacetime history. Well, it depends how you define peace and time, I suppose. But clearly the Conservatives don't include between the period between the First and Second World War as a period of peace. Okay. Now, it wasn't a... It wasn't exactly an um, a enjoyable period of peace, but back here we have peace in the global financial crisis, and back then they had peace in the Great Depression. And you can see that the budget deficit was bigger back in the 1920s and 30s than it is now, but it was the only other time in history that the budget deficit has been as big in a peacetime period. So is there something we can drag out of the, the Great Depression and the, Second World, uh, and the period we're going through now? Is there something similar? Well, I want to switch focus now to private debt, and this is where Anne certainly got me over a barrel. Of course, I was going to talk about private debt. This is the ratio of private debt to GDP in England since 1880, with absolutely no trend until a certain woman turned up in Parliament, Maggie Thatcher. And now, every country I'm going to show you has got a trend of rising debt over time. Private debt. But no country has a pattern like England's where there was no trend until a particular politician turned up and the philosophy that came out of that politics. So you had literally a century before Maggie Thatcher came to power 
where private debt bounced around, went up and down in booms and recessions and so on, but it didn't rise as a percentage of GDP until after Maggie liberalised everything for the finance sector and it trebled in 30 years. And then notice it's falling. This decline over here is very important. Now, could this be relevant? Could there be something about credit, which is what change in debt really is, and economic performance? So now what I'm doing is plotting the change in debt every year as a percentage of GDP, and the change in debt is credit. That's how when banks create a loan for you, they create money for you which you spend, so the change in debt is credit. And when you look at credit between Maggie Thatcher's ascension and now, the increase in credit, the credit every year was roughly 11.5% of GDP. Now that, in your own terms, if you want to put that in an effective sense, it's as though more than 10% of the spending you would do is financed on your credit card, okay? on a sustained basis over time, which of course means your debt rose over time. And what it applies to you as an individual does apply at the aggregate level. This is where conventional economics is quite wrong. One of the many ways it's quite wrong, it ignores this whole factor. I'm, I, I obsess about it because they don't even talk about it. So for the whole period of the Thatcher, uh, Thatcher and post-Thatcher, including Blair, I believe my comparisons of Thatcher and Blair, uh, maybe for the pub later, um, but for that whole period, it was a credit-driven economy with increasing levels of private debt until you hit a peak, as I showed you earlier. Now, since the crisis has hit, it's been 2% of GDP sometimes negative too, and it's below this dotted line here. The change in debt is negative and therefore credit's negative. You're actually spending less than your income because you're devoting part of it to repay your debt. That's why the economy is in a funk right now. Nothing to do with the government running a deficit. In fact, the government deficit counteracts that funk to some large degree, but not enough. Now, to call it Labor's Great Recession, I mean, I come from a country of political spin. You know, Shane Warne should really be a politician. <laughs> but the spin you guys get over here leaves Shane for dead because Labor's Great Recession? How did you... How, I know people in this room didn't let themselves get fooled. But how did the public get fooled to think that the Labor Party in Britain caused this effect in the rest of the world? Okay. I've got seven countries here, not quite chosen at random. They're fairly major and fairly important. Mainly, I've got one uh, continental country and the rest are... Uh, uh, two continental countries and one which is uh, um, two, 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 two continental, the rest are all Anglo-Saxon. But you'll notice that every last one of them, except Australia, had a recession. So directly, British Labor Party is responsible for the recession in the United States, Ireland, Spain, Germany and Canada. Well, you know, if that's the case, you know, maybe Labor is more powerful than it thinks. <laughs> So the real problem is there's too much private debt worldwide and we're getting an incredible smokescreen to focus upon the role of government debt when government debt is the best analogy for that it's like an air conditioner. The amount of government money being pumped into the economy will rise when the private money falls. It balances out the system. If you instead have a bunch of obsessive victims of first year economics running the country, otherwise known as the Conservative Party, then they will actually turn the air conditioner down when it gets cold outside and up when it gets hot outside. So you'll freeze inside the building or you'll cook, but you certainly won't want to stay inside it. So this is looking at the global picture now, the level of private debt. And England starts at 60% of GDP as its private debt level back in 1975, starts to rise just after Maggie gets into office, continues going up and finally get to the peak which you hit in 2010 and now it's down. Notice Japan over here and I've noticed Japan's crisis occurring at this point in time and the global financial crisis further on in 2008. If you now look, I've got the sequence out of, out of sequence here, pardon me. If you now look at the change in debt, which is the creation of credit, the crises occurred when that change of debt slowed down. So what we're going through is a private sector phenomenon, not a government one. The government is the... In fact, it, it counteracts the downturn being caused by the private sector. When you look back again, I'm pardon, I've sort of those animations out of order, but the pre-crisis level of credit was about 12.5% of GDP every year. The post-crisis level is 2%. That's why global economies are in suffering what they're calling secular stagnation. It's not secular stagnation, it's credit stagnation. So we have a private debt crisis, and I've, this little chart I'm producing for a number of countries, and I'll show England 
ultimately. I call it the smoking gun of credit because it points out that the crises, when they have occurred, have all occurred because the credit system has broken down. So the red line is GDP, income alone. The, red, the blue line is GDP plus, plus change in debt, which is credit. When that peaks and goes flat, that's when the crisis begins. So this is Japan's crisis. So even though they've had some growth in GDP over that 25 years that they've been stuck in a crisis, the total demand caused by GDP plus credit has actually been heading down. That's why Japan has had a lost, not a decade now, but lost quarter century. The same thing applies for America. And it's very clear in the American case that the crisis began when that rate of growth of debt, which is credit, slowed down and went negative. And that's the duration of their crisis. They're now having a boom again, not because they're through the financial crisis, they've still got a massively excessive level of private debt, it's because they're borrowing money again. That's what's driving the economy forward. And the same thing in a much more messy fashion applies to the United Kingdom. You can see again you had a crisis back in the 1990s. Your crisis began again when the rate of growth of debt, private debt slowed down. Government debt rose at that time to compensate for the private sector trying to get out of debt or having bankruptcies and so on. So the, and the, the correlation is enormous. I, I am a non-orthodox economist and I teach a very non, run a very non-orthodox program at Kingston University, one of a, a handful in the country that do it. Greenwich, Greenwich Leeds and West England are three of the others, plus also SOAS. The rest of them all teach the conventional nonsense. Now, that conventional nonsense says there's no relationship between credit and macroeconomics because they see credit as just a transfer from one person to another, the saver lends to a borrower, and the two cancel each other out. That's completely naive. I must congratulate the Bank of England for pointing it out in a recent paper about money creation in the modern world. They say that's nonsense. It's not the institutional structure. And when I do the macroeconomics in that, it means that credit is the determining factor for the state of the economy. So this is the red line is the change in debt, which is credit creation in America over the last 25 years, and the blue line is unemployment. If anybody here is old enough to have ever done a Rorschach test, remember those? Put a blotter and go bang like that and you get two patterns, okay? These are supposed to be unrelated to each other according to conventional economics. They're so closely related, it looks like a Rorschach plot. Okay. It's not quite as clear cut in the English case, but the same basic pattern is there. When you've got increasing money, created by the private sector, your booming economy, falling unemployment, but of course you're accumulating debt and it finally breaks down as it did for the UK. That's when your unemployment started to rise. Government spending counteracted that, made it less extreme than it would otherwise have been. It did not cause it. And equally watching bubbling house prices here, that's got a slight twist in its tail because the flow of new, of new mortgage debt is the demand for houses which sustains the price level, but if that's rising, it actually drives it up. So it's actually the acceleration of mortgage debt, not the change, that drives house prices. We're having a boom in house prices right now, even though mortgage debt is falling, because it's falling more slowly, it's actually accelerating. One of those tricky little things of mathematics. So when I do a correlation in America, and I've done the, the causal analysis here, it's definitely mortgage debt drives house prices, not the other way around. That's what's causing the bubbles. So it isn't the case you want to bring in more supply of housing, you want to cut back the supply of credit that finances in the first place, because all it's doing is driving up asset prices and driving the, the, youth, the youth out of being able to buy anywhere to live. And uh, this is going to get slightly difficult in this room. And you're right, I'm going to show the Minsky model. Um, this is showing that the, 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 the straightforward thinking that, it, that politicians fall for, and it's both sides of politics do it. Okay, I'm not going to single out the Conservatives here. The Labor Party's fallen for it as well in Miliband. I don't know that John's quite so caught up in this one, but I, this is a little case I want to make. I want to make it possible for politicians to play with the toy economy and see what happens when they do it. So this is my software package called Minsky, and I'll bring it up on screen. Simple model. <laughs> It freaks out my students too. It actually freaks out some of my opponents in economics too, which is quite a lot of fun. But what I've got here is a model where the government can actually control its spending based on the level of unemployment that it's satisfied with, so, or the percentage of the population it wants to have a job. So I've got this set at the moment that they want to have 65% of the population having a job, which is roughly the percentage that 
gets employed and the economy is booming. And when you look at it, what you see is they've got a very high level of government, government spending compared to GDP and a very high government debt level. Well, the obvious thing you do is you put up with a high level of unemployment. So rather than wanting 64%, 65%, you go for 64%. So your spending drops, as you can see from that graph, but oh dear, the ratio has risen. Well, that didn't work, but you know the basic law of economics. If it didn't work the first time, do it the second time harder. <laughs> so you reduce it again, and oh dear, the ratio rises again. Well, we've just got to keep on going, you know? 63 wasn't... Let's have 60... Let's put another 1% of the population out of a job. That bloody ratio continues rising because they're ignoring the red line, which is private debt, which is driving the whole crisis. Well, let's keep on going, damn you. If you bloody people won't get a, you know won't reduce that our government spending will just take Oh hell, what's happened here? You've ended up in chaos, guys. You've caused the system to break down by taking out the feedback that balanced the system in the first place. In effect, you've taken out the air conditioning unit out of the economy. You've now got the ups and downs of the climate inside your house. So we have to think in a systemic way about economics. We can't think in the simplistic, linear way that my profession generally encourages and that certainly politicians and a lot of journalists, unfortunately, also fall for. Now, I want to show one of the simple reasons why these sorts of phenomena occur. So I want you to imagine an economy. This is a mental exercise. Imagine an economy with a GDP of 100 pounds. And that actually consists of 100, one pound turning over 100 times in one year. Really fast-moving economy. And then the government, let's say the government decides it wants to run a surplus that year to pay off some foreign debt or something like that. So imagine they're a victim of the euro. They run a, a, a surplus of 1% of GDP that year. What is GDP the next year? Any guesses? It's zero. That surplus takes out of existence the only dollar in circulation. So a government surplus is a way of destroying money. Anybody who thinks it's going to make the economy grow faster needs a lesson in logic. And unfortunately, that's most politicians. So the government surplus is a way to destroy part of the money supply each year. And the mistake we're making is treating the government like a household. Now, it's a simple analogy. And there's wonderful, wonderful English American humorist called Mention who once said to every human problem, there's a simple solution that is neat, plausible, and wrong. <laughs> And the government is not a household. The go a household has to earn money to spend it. The government creates money when it's spending it seeds its taxation. Now that is exactly the same situation as a government, as a bank, making more loans and it gets back in repayments. Nobody ever panics when that's the situation. In fact, they're trying to cause that situation on a regular basis. But by making the false analogy of the government with a household, they say the government should always spend less than it gets in, in taxation, which means it ends up destroying money. And the government deficit as well also counters the private sector deleveraging during a crisis. The main deficit, if you want to worry about a deficit, it's the trade deficit we should worry about. And England's got a serious problem on that front. It's not producing anywhere near enough, and going across to the city certainly hasn't, hasn't helped it out that way. But I don't see government spending as enough. I don't see a deficit enough. I also believe we need to reduce private debt in a fairly substantial way, but what I call a modern debt jubilee. I'll leave it there and we'll go to the discussion later. Thank you.